Hey everyone, just give me one minute for setting up the iPad. Actually. Okay, yeah, I'll give you a link on the chat right now. I was going to do that. Thank you for the reminder though. Um, okay. So here is the link. I'll put this on the website after the class too. Okay. So let's see. So I believe everyone sees the screen. I'll put the chat chatting the chat up just a second. Okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome to the lecture seven. So let's get started. So today's outline. First, oh oh, so announcements are actually outdated. So. Yeah, I, had, I forgot to edit the announcements. So we'll be briefly recapping a few concepts that we covered last, week, last lecture on Monday, especially the bottleneck problem in the encoder decoder and why how it has motivated the concept of attention on the decoder side, from the decoder to encoder to be more exact. And then uh, we'll be moving into why applying this attention to machine reading comprehension, or I would say in general, some natural language understanding on long documents could be challenging. So we'll be talking about that. What was the challenges back then to be more exact about three, four years ago. And then we'll be covering about, we'll be talking about a few ways that people have tried to use the attention on these long documents that also have accompanied with our questions. So this will be quite important for your assignment because uh, your second assignment will be about using attention for token classification, especially uh, to do the machine reading comprehension. So today's lecture and next lecture will be very important for your assignment too. And then, so it'll be a bit about also history, how the, uh, the, the attention mechanism has evolved for I think last five years, I would say. It was very fast and it has been one of the, I think um, the development attention was development of attention was one of the most significant um, achievements I think in NLP, not only NLP, but also I think um, other areas in AI. And lastly, so we'll talk about how these all connect to just using self-attention, which is also known as transformer in 2017, a seminal paper, paper I, I would say. Yep, so an assignment, announcements first. So these are outdated. I forgot to update them. I'll just write it with the pen. So there are not that many announcements. Um, it's just that assignment one is due next Wednesday, just a reminder again. So please start early enough because you might uh, run into some troubles and you might want to ask questions, but of course, last minute questions are oftentimes not answered very well, right? And assignment two will be out right after assignment one is due. And two will be, as I have said, it will be about 
making an um, MRC system using attention with LSTMs and um, more of a transformer-like attention though. So it, it's a bit of a, not really implementing any a particular work, but it will help you to understand transformer without putting too much time on training or trying to tune. The reason is that um, just to give you a heads up, um, transformer architecture has, is very sensitive to hyperparameters. So that's how I decided to make the assignment two in two so that you don't have to worry too much about it for now. Yep, so, and um, I'll add a few links today, especially regarding transformer. Um, I highly, highly recommend reading the annotated transformer by um, by a rush, Alex Larush. Um, that was a very good explanation of a paper with the code. So I'll talk about that a bit in the at the end of the lecture too, though. Okay, so let's go with recap first. So in our last lecture, we talked about the concept of encoder decoder, right? So this was a very, um, very very novel idea in that in, if we want to do some text generation or we want to map some text to another text, example task would be machine translation. Then it traditionally, for instance, statistical machine translation were using very sophisticated rule-based systems to map each word or each phrase to some certain list of possible maps, mappings. And then basically people use these pre-built dictionary or maps, mappings to create um, a coherent mapping for the entire sentence, which was fine, but apparently had a lot of limitations, especially it requires a lot of human engineering and time to maintain and also improve. And now the neural net has come into play about 2013 to 12 to 2012-ish. So there were, uh, this is basically an effort to how we can do such text generation with neural nets. And the idea was quite, I would say very succinct in that it's using the RNN that we are quite familiar with. Actually, it was something that we were quite familiar with for many years on the Encoder side relatively quite apparent. We want to use the encoder to summarize the, the entire sentence into one vector. And then we use this one vector as the input for the decoding RNN, where the decoding RNN has um, has the has the input as the previous time, previous time steps output so that it can be basically iteratively decoded each time step. And this was a this was basically used for machine translation. And back then it was clear that although encoder decoder um, was kind of working, but there was a really big problem that there was still a gap between neural net based encoder decoder machine translation and the SMT. And to close the gap, the work that was followed by right after was exactly resolving basically this bottleneck problem, um, which was that can you really assume that the vector that represents the, the, encoding, the encoding side, the input, really contains the, the entire information that you want to? And the assumption is oftentimes people thought probably no, it's probably not gonna be possible to really encode the entire sentences meaning into one vector. So the, the work was trying to, the, the follow-up work, follow work was trying to really resolve this issue by instead of summarizing the entire input into a single vector offline just once, the idea was to allow the decoder to directly access few relevant input tokens dynamically. So here comes the really the difference, right? Because when you're trying to decode that you're trying to compute the next time step of the RNN yt here, in order to obtain this, you're using st minus one and then compute the similarity or um, the basically the attention weights between st minus one 
and each output hidden state of the input side. And that basically means that we can focus on different parts of the input at each time step. And another way of looking at it is that attention is basically dynamic summarization of the input, depending on where you're at during the decoding time. So this is actually uh, quite easy to explain how this happens in machine translation, because when you're working on machine translation, you are mapping a sentence to another language that has same meaning, but of course in another language, right? Then conceptually how human would do is when you're reading, for instance, um, the first few words in the input, you want to map this to a few words in the output language. So let's say I'm translating from um, say Korean to English, right? And then you're reading Korean um, characters in the input side. And when you're writing the first word in the English, um, most of the times probably you want to focus on the start part of the Korean too. But this is not always the case because language has different structures. Um, of course, Korean and English both start with subject, but Korean then has the object followed by the subject, whereas the English has verb, right? So there's different structures. So it's not guaranteed that what you're attending on will be always mon monotonically increasing from the start. It will be jumping around. So that's why um, the concept of attention is important, but it's not very precisely definable. And we can think of the decoder with attention on the input side can be very similar to how human would do for the machine translation. And I think I mentioned that this is also an important point, especially in neural nets, that the um, this can be considered as uh, accessing a uh, few relevant to input tokens, but accessing hard accessing is non-differentiable. So we want to make that into differentiable by using softmax. And also we mentioned that the encoder also needs attention too. And I want to especially focus on the MRC part. Although, um, of course, the MT and MRC were very uh, concurrently being developed and researched. So it, it, I, I don't mean that the MRC was something that people wanted to solve right after MT. It was more of a, the both communities were influenced by each other. But um, it's, it's good to actually go come back to MRC side because MRC doesn't need decoder usually because we're uh, formulating the problem as token classification, but it has a bit more complicated encoder side input because it has to deal with very long documents. This is different from how, what the MT is interested in. Um, I mean, a bit different, although at the end, MT also want to deal with long documents. But back then, MT was mostly dealing with uh, short sentences. So at least in the MRC, there was a problem that people were more willing to re resolve than the MT, MT side at the moment. And that was a, uh, Exactly. This is like uh, actually also recap what the MRC problem is. So MRC problem has two t two inputs, text and question, and the problem really is the length of this context, right? And also another difference is that unlike MT, where you only have one input in the MRC, you have two inputs, right? So handling that will be also can be tricky, but um, we had uh, this assumption that the answer will be always a span in the context. This is more of a simplification in the extractive MRC setup. When you're going into abstractive setup, then maybe that will not be held. So what's the problem with applying the attention to MRC? So. This was about, I would say, um, 2015 to 2017. So 2015 marks the um, year that um, one of the first neural net paper on the MRC was released 
we'll be covering that soon. And 2017 really marks the, um, the introduction of transformers. So, but I think between these two, uh, these years, in, in the, during these years, the, the, how we can apply to MR, attention to MRC was a very important problem, problem in NLP. One of all, another reason also being that MRC had very direct application to question answering. But, and we all knew that attention was a very powerful technique by 2015 because of the, how it helped on the machine translation, which was actually the paper was released on 20, in 2015. And also it was also clear that attention mechanism can be also used in vision side. For instance, um, captioning, when, you're, when you look at the image uh, and then generate some sentence about the image, attention was very useful too. So, but then there were two issues if we wanted to just apply attention um, in a way, in the exactly same way that we use it for MT. Number one, how can we deal with the two inputs? Because MT has one input, but we have two inputs here, right? We have pretty good answer now, but back then it was not clear. And trust me, like everyone was very troubled with this um, difference. And number two is how do we deal with the long length of the context? And again, this was a bit different from the machine translation problem. So I think it is worth mentioning that um, one of our first work in this domain would be uh, teaching machines to read and comprehend uh, in 2015. And this was basically about how we can create attention mechanism from question to context side. So I'll try to be brief and also uh, details I'll be talking about could be a bit different from the, the exact formulation in the paper, but the overall idea will be the same to help you, to aid you understand without going into too much details though. So the teach, this paper was dealing with a data set called CNN Daily Mail. I think I have been dominantly talking about squat for machine reading comprehension data set. This is also MRC data set though. It's very early actually MRC data set. In fact, this data set was proposed in the same paper. So the paper was talking about, was proposing both a data set and also a model that can be used for the data set. And it's actually quite interesting how this data set was created. So this data set was automatically created from news articles from CNN and Daily Mail. So that's what, where the name comes from. Just a second. Yep. And the, how they made this data set is, it's quite actually also very smart. So uh, if you go into these news media, or if you read these news articles, you will see that there is a long article and also they have some title or headlines that kind of summarizes the news, entire news article. So what the authors thought was, okay, then we have this list, which is basically free. I mean, uh, unless there is a license issue, but for ac academic purpose, probably there was no much problem using these articles and questions, I mean, the headlines. And we can turn the title of the article into question, each title of the article into question by basically masking one of the words in the title and trying to guess it. It, it makes sense because for instance, if the title is something like, Barack Obama visited England. I think it's now Joe Biden, right? Joe Biden visited England. And it's the article is talking about Joe Biden visiting England. And if you hide this um, Joe Biden with X, and if you uh, try to guess this entity, it's basically the same as asking, given the article, who, who visited England, right? So it was a very, a very smart way of creating a question answering data set or a machine reading comprehension data set. Although of course, in this case, the question is not exactly interrogative format, but it's rather 
a closed format. So we call this closed format when you are hiding one word in a complete sentence and trying to guess it. There are po more popular term these days, um, uh, which is masked mass language model or something similar to that. So um, we'll, we'll get to that because uh, that was actually quite a significant thing that led to the devel development of BERT. But anyways, you know, for now. And then, um, of course, but we don't want to hide things like if the title was um, Joe Biden visited England, we don't want to hide, I would say, let's say that just Joe, because it's pretty clear that if it's something Biden, then probably Joe. Also, or if, if we have some word like is, are, these are very not so informative words. There is no point guessing these words. So the data set uh, made sure that what gets masked or what gets hidden is always an entity using some named entity recognition model. So, but I think now you agree that although the format is a bit different, the it's quite similar data set or task to the squad or other MRS data sets. So good. So, and the, so the work was the, one of the baseline that the paper proposed was actually using just direction, bi-directional LSTM. I think I, I told you that LSTM is unidirectional, but you can just uh, append two LSTMs with different directions and it's bi-directional LSTM, right? Quite, um, quite obvious. And that was baseline, but they realized that that's not working so well. So, and they basically pointed out that, oh, it's not working well because once you get to question side, then even if you basically append these two, once you get to question side, then it's clear that the uh, whatever gets conveyed through the LSTM's memory will not be good enough for the question to be answered. So what the paper proposed is basically they run by directional LSTM on both context and question side independently. So that's what this, these are, these are LSTMs. And then they want to summarize the context, but they don't want to just summarize context offline, but they, they want to summarize the context for each question word which means then you're looking at the current question word and you're using this question word to get the summary of the context. And that's actually quite, that's, so that's what, uh, how, what you're computing is basically R in this, in this um, setup. So you're computing R, which is summary of the context on each time step of the question. And then at the end, once you have obtained the, the final R in the, on the question side, there is a simple recurrent relationship between each R though. So this is like basically R and N. And then you're using the final time step of the context summary and also the summary of the question, which is U by using just the first and the last vector of the the forward direction LSTM and backward direction LSTM respect respectively, and basically use these two and concatenate them or sum them whatever ways you think is the best to get G. And basically G gets classified into entities. And these entities are coming from the context. So they actually um, use the context as the, target classification. So it's quite similar to, I would say, um, token classification, right? But the point here is that what I'm trying to say is how you obtain G is very similar to the sick to sick with attention where the question LSTM is considered as the decoder part, right? Because you're looking at each question word and you're attending on the context and trying to summarize it 
But difference here is that the summary is not, um, its summary could be either dynamic or static. Dynamic means that you have you compute the R before you compute the next time steps hidden state of the question, or it can be just computed offline after you compute all the LSTM values of the question side. There's a difference because on on the in the machine translation, of course, you don't know what you're gonna produce, so you can only depend on the current time step. But in the machine reading comprehension, you're given the question, which is the fixed. So why don't you can also do this more of a static or offline way. So I'll just try to give you a more of a mathematical sketch how this would work. So I'm going to use H1 to HT for the output hidden state on the context side. So this is a context side, right? And I'm going to use U1 to U, I'll say L for the question side. And U will be just simply, so U will be, in this case, I'm just not considering the bidirectionality for the sake of uh, simplicity. So although the, the diagram is telling me that the U is just the blue part of the first word and red part of the last word, but so suppose that, I mean, it really doesn't matter much. So such, just suppose that U is just simply U1 plus UL. Okay. Um, let's just do averaging it. Why not? Just trying to give you some more of a concept. Then, then how you compute R uh, one, this is R one, is as following. So R one is you want to summarize the context side, but this summarization basically. Your, so summarization importance is how much weight you're gonna give for each H of I, right? But that, um, so that weight, I'll call it um, SI, is dependent on the similarity between each H of I and U of one, right? So what we want to make this into is that R1 is summation of SI, and H I, where I is coming from one to T. So we're doing some sort of a dynamic averaging of the context where S I is basically computed by computing similarity between each H I, wait, so I have to be careful with this. Um, yeah, right. Each H I and the current query question word vector, which is U, U1. Or to be more gener uh, general, I mean, to, to make this more general then we can just use J instead of one, right? Because we're just talking about arbitrary J in the query side. So I'll just do that. So of course, then R1 will be um, using the U1. But we mentioned that you get, you see the same problem here too, right? If you just try to compute similarity, then you cannot uh, ensure that the summation of these similarity scores will be um, one, right? So what's the, the tool that we can use to make this solvable to one? Softmax, right? So instead of defining this way, how you define actually is that SI is you exponentiate some function between h i and u j, and then you divide this by summation of all other values, right? h k and u j, where the k is coming from 
actually not all other values, but including the current value too. So k is one to t. This is very um, lengthy way of writing, right? So what people usually use to write this is actually it's they instead write this way. So if you see this on paper, then note that this is basically softmax. This, this, uh, so you know that this means it's proportional to, right? So SI is proportional to exponentiation of some similarity function between HI and U of J. Then how would we define the similarity function? So there are several ways. And I think we talked about one way that the original decoder with attention model used. So we can compute, so H1, HT, U1, U not T, sorry, UL. So how do we define the similarity between each HI and UJ? So the, the way that the, this paper used was exactly the same as the decoder attention model, the sick to sick, which is you have a weight to learn and then you dot product this with 10 H of some matrix weight for both UNH plus bias. And here are the um, learnable parts are this, 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 these are our parameters. There's to learn. But I told you that this is probably not, this is not the only way to compute the similarity between two vectors or two, I would say tokens, right? So I also told you that in Luong et al, in 2015, they instead used this definition It's a bit more, uh, much more simpler, much simpler, which is HI, some W to learn, and UJ, maybe bias too. It's, and of course here, these two are parameters to, to learn. So back then we had little idea whether which one is better. At the end, it turns out that at least in terms of the accuracy, it looks like there is no much difference. And more efficient one is definitely than preferred, right? Than the than um, the other way, which is, and we'll see that uh, if we have time today in today's lecture, why this is more efficient, the, the second way. Although what's being used these days is a bit different from this, but it's quite similar to the, it's the same idea. Basically you're creating a, something in the middle of H and U and compute that. And it's a bit different. We'll see what, what that means, but, um, but definitely then the, the efficiency is clearly won by the second way. Okay, so that's great, right? So then we have a very good idea how we can summarize the, the context side from the question, very neat way. And in fact, this was working better than using just LSTMs. So that was one of the first proof that the attention also works well, pretty well on the, not only on the machine translation, but also on the MRC. Then natural question is then of course, okay, if you have done the context to question attention, why don't we do the other side, right? Okay, let's do attention from context to question. Not the other, uh, if we have, we can do question to context. And it turns out that um, this is, it's actually fits better for the squad exactly because squad was formulated in a way that we're making, we made that into token classification problem, right? So we'll see that why that's better. So this was um, 
eye color paper in 2017. And this was applied on mainly on squat. So you, if you look at the ears, you will see that this is after the squat was released in 2016. And it's mainly on extractive MRC. And it's exactly the opposite of uh, the, the, first, the first model where the now the question is not the decoder side, but it's on the encoder side more of, if you compare that with the, the, the sick to sick and context can be considered as more of a decoder side. And recall that in MRC, we want to predict the start and the end. Although I want to mention that this was not so obvious at this time though. So um, now we are seeing that, okay, if the answer is always extractive, why don't we just predict the start and the end? But that was not so obvious. And this paper was the, I think the first paper to really approach the problem that way in the MRC, it's better to approximate start and the end instead of uh, approaching the problem more of as a biotagging problem. And so if you, I'll just also again, give you some mathematical intuitions how this, this works. So uh, forgive me that of course, papers use a bit different notations. So now you see that um, they're using H of um, either P or, P or R for the passive side or the context side. And they're using H of Q instead of U we used in the previous example, but hopefully you can make that generalization. So the idea is as following. So what we wanna do here is basically we want to compute the, the next hidden state of the context side. So if we just do that without worrying about the question, I'm gonna look at this part, by the way. So if you wanna compute the hidden state, then what you're gonna do is if you were not worrying about question side, your HT will be, they use LSTM, so I'll just put LSTM. And LSTM has two inputs. One is the, the current time steps input, which is, um, I'll say XT, and also the previous time, step, time steps input. To be more exact, actually, you also need to put a CT minus one. And in fact, you're also predicting both at the same time, but you can consider both as a both hidden state if you wanna make it generic, in, um, very compatible with uh, generic RNN. So I'm gonna just use HT here. So in a way, maybe then I think it's better for you to think of this as just RNN. Although in reality, it's always involving some gating mechanism. But the idea here was that instead of doing this, because this will not be aware of question at all, what they did was let's define HT to be RNN. It's same up to here, but instead of defining the, the input as just, just the, the current time steps context word embedding, we want to define it as concatenation of XT and some summarization of the question side. So I'll just put uh, call that UT. So basically summarization of the question at time step T. So this entire thing is considered as the input to the RNN and HT minus one is exactly the same. So this is quite similar to, again, um, how the encoder decoder works with attention, right? So how do you compute UT? So UT, so I'm gonna assume that I'm gonna use the same notation as the previous example. So instead of H1, Q, I'll be using uh, U1, U2, U3, and 
um, UL. So then it's quite similar how they do this. So same, right? So now again, we want to compute UT and UT is just a summation of score of, uh, I'll say, let's use J because we use J for the subscript. And this is a scale value. And then we want to sum, average sum the, the U of J for each, each J from one to L. And same again. So how do we compute then SJ? SJ is some similarity function between UJ and HT, right? Oh, we're just working on T. So to be more very precise, actually, SJ will also depend on T. So maybe we want to put something like T here, right? But hopefully you get the point. Um, that's great. But we noted that we always want to be on the probabilistic domain, which means summation is one. So instead of equality, what we are actually what we actually want here is we want this to be proportional to exponentiation of some similarity function between between uj and ht. And how do we compute similarity again? There are several ways. Just choose one of them that fits your need. Then now what this can, what this is capable of is then for each time step in H, now you have very good idea what you wanna look at from the question side. So maybe if the question is especially really long, then you can basically have a very different summarization of the question on each time step. And at the end, we, are, we have the output. And this is just another layer of LSTM. This is just another layer of LSTM. And then what we do at the end is we want to peek into this, the HT. And we want to compute the start and end position of the answer. So suppose that we don't have this layer. I mean, it doesn't really matter we add another layer or not, right? So suppose that we don't have a, another layer. We're using HT to predict, oh, sorry, my bad. We're using HT to predict the final answer with this definition. Then how would, how would you find the start position and the end position? And I'll just show you a really, really easy way to do this. Although um, the, 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 the interesting thing is that paper, uh, the papers from these days try to use more complex ones, but it turns out that if the model is good enough, it can be quite simplified. So I'm gonna show you the simplified ones, but if you have time or if you have, want to read these papers, then you will see that people use more complex ways of computing the final answer. So suppose that now we're given all these HTs, right? H1 are now aware of the question, right? These are not just aware of the passage information, the context information, but they're also aware of the question. Then how, how we can obtain the start position is, is quite simple. Like the, this is like basically the, the, the most, the, the more straightforward way. You basically map this H1 to scale value and then you find the the the, be, the be best scale value, the, the highest scale value. So do you have a weight for the start? So what you want to do is what is argmax of i such that you're argmaxing over weight for start? And you transpose this and with each hi. And this is a parameter to learn. But so basically this will be your final answers 
start point. Let's say let's call this y1 because it's the first position of the, the, the start position of the answer. You can do the same thing for the end position, but you use different weight. Quite simple, right? Yep, so that's that. And of course, um, how you can train this, you want to formulate this into prob prob probabilistic distribution. So you do exactly the same thing. You basically use softmax to make this into probabilistic distribution and then compute the negative log probability. So I think um, I'll not cover that in here. Hopefully you will get the point during the, when, as you do the assignment. So, but please feel free to ask question if you have any question when you're doing this assignment. So I'm gonna rest. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna go for, go for a, a short break, a three minutes break up until uh, 3.23. And we will have 27 minutes to cover the rest of the attention and a bit about transformer. Although we'll be going into transformer, real transformer in the next lecture. Yeah, three minute break. All right. Okay. 
So I hope everyone's back. This was uh, just trying to write a note here. Start and end. All right, so up to here. So what's your, I would say, what's your impression about context to question and question to context? Then I think the natural direction is that, okay, so you have done question to context, context to question. So why don't we do both, right? So in fact, that's the, uh, that was one of a, the next work uh, in the community. So there were several, I would say, concurrent works. I'll talk about actually uh, my work. I, I, this is, I, I was uh, one of the authors here. And basically we, our, our work was basically about how we can do attention on both sides, both directions at the same time. And just a second. So it's a bit weird to talk about my work, but let's see. Um, so I think now, if you look at this diagram, it's quite familiar, right? So we have these um, LSTMs. So these are the LSTMs. LSTM on the question and context side. One, one thing that we added was that we, uh, the, the work basically adds the character embedding layer. So it's trying to use also the character level information. But the, really the, the core part was that basically, why don't we do both? Can we just do compute attention on uh, both directions and use that for, for the output? So, and then after we compute the attention, then we can have another LSTM layers to get the output. But now you see that the output is quite similar too that we're using just a softmax was with some weight to, to predict the start and end position of the, the final answer. So again, similar to the previous works, let's get into a bit of mathematics, like what's the really happening at the, how you can do the bidirectional tension. So here's the, uh, the a bit of a, I would say, um, the difference between computing attention dynamically as opposed to static, stat, stat, statically. So in the previous one, in the previous the work match LSTM, when you're computing attention from context to question, you're basically computing attention by HT is equal to RNN, of course, in this case, LSTM, and you are appending xt with the summarization of the question at that time step t. So yeah, actually, I wanted to make sure that t, to, to be more exact, actually, you, you have t minus one, by the way, because you cannot summarize it, summarize with the current, um, no, I'm saying uh, to, to correct what I wrote in the previous slides. Yeah, just a second. This was my mistake. So you're computing the U of T and you're computing similarity and you can only use the previous time steps, right? And to be more exact, because you haven't defined HT yet. So it should be HT minus one. And you actually append this with also the current input. This is okay though, right? You're basically appending these two, ht minus one and xt, you're comparing this with u of j and computing summary function, we discussed that, right? So hopefully um, it was not super confusing. And we can do the same thing here. I mean, we can, we're basically doing the same thing here, not in this model, I'm saying, um, this is from the, um, the previous work, is that you compute the u of t, and you used ht minus one, but you know that ut is basically the summation of j, where the you have a similarity weight j and u of a j, right? This was the previous work, and here the a little difference is that instead of putting this ut inside the RNN, 
you instead just do compute the RNN as is. And append the U of T outside. So it's pretty clear, of course, that appending outside is really simple. It's not, uh, it's not like it's the coding guys, it's not too much different, right? But um, the dependency will be simpler. So uh, the reason why we do this way is because if we want to compute the attention on the other side from the query to context, then we have to actually do this way. Otherwise it will be, dependency will be cyclic. So we, we, we wanted to avoid that. So the work is basically, we want to um, the separate the summarization of the question from the recurrent relation so that we can actually then, then basically compute this offline, right? So that's exactly this part. Then, um, then appending part is exactly equivalent to this, this, this green thing, context query attention, right? That's what you want to do to obtain the U of T. But we can also do the other way, which is we want to compute what each question word uh, what what vector each, each question word looks at, right? Which is basically what is the, um, I would say, how, how, what, okay, let's see, think about the symbol that we're gonna use. So we compute a UT, but we can also the other way, which is what is the summarization of the, the context side given each query input. So I'm gonna use the G here. So I'm going to follow the same diagram. So G is basically the summarization of context at each time step. And remember, this is quite similar to how the, the first uh, teaching machines to read and comprehend works is exactly the summation of now it's um, wait, the G of not I, I'm sorry, G of uh, J, right? Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, just a second. It's funny that, yeah, I'm confused about what I did like four years ago. Uh, G of, uh, I think we can think of this way, right? So basically, okay, I'll put this way. Yeah, so the point is here that the, you want to obtain a single vector at each context time step, the document size, the context size time step, but that vector is basically the summarization of the, the I would say context from the question side. So that's that actually, so I wanna, I wanna say that um, the how we formulate this is a bit complicated but the point is we want to compute the attention from query to context and we want to use that in a way that, but if we just do the same way as we did the context to query, then we're going to have uh, one vector per query time step, right? So, which means then uh, we have to like this time step from U1 to UJ right here. And for each time step in the in the query side, we want to obtain the summary of the context, which I can call um, something like I'll say uh, I'll just use a term um, v, and v of one is the summarization of the context at time step q, 
and v of j is the summarization of the context at time step j. And what we want to do is we want to, we, after we did the summarization, um, we want to basically convey this summarized vectors into the, the each time step of the context side, right? So then that's where we have this query to context layer so that we can have a dynamic summarization of V1 to Vj and each time step of the context and use that for the attention side too. So maybe I can bring a better explanation next time, but um, for now, uh, for the, also the time being, I'll just put this way, but you can think of it as, okay, the attention is happening in both directions. Okay. And then after this was the really the work of uh, um, self-attention. And so it's quite uh, also maybe not too surprising because, um, because then now we have this bi-directional attention. So let's look at the, this diagram. So we have this context side and the question side, and we have this attention, bi-directional attention here. But why don't we just also apply attention to itself, right? Because then in that case, then maybe each word in the context will be aware of all other words in the context. So by this time in 2017, it was clear that, okay, if attention helps from question to context and also context to question, then let's also do attention from context to context or question to question. And that was exactly the point of self-attention that we want to apply attention on all directions, not just to cross attention between context and question, but also between context and itself. And this was especially helpful if wanted, we wanted to do um, more, we want to handle long-term dependency. And how this works, so basically you can think of this as the, the, pre, pre, uh, the previous bidirectional attention up to here. And then you apply some self-attention mechanism on top of this. And how that works is it's quite actually quite straightforward because you can think of it this way. So now suppose that after this, we have the context, context vectors, which, which now are again, H1 to HT. This is, these are now aware of question, right? because they have gone through the attention. And then we apply self-attention by basically, basically, so what now we want to obtain, let's, let's call this H1, HT of the uh, first layer. Then we want to obtain the self-attention, self-attended vectors of these vectors. Um, we want to basically map this to H2 of one to H2 of T, where H2 of, uh, uh, two of each time step T is exactly, I will say simply weighted sum of the first layers hidden states, right? Excuse my bad. First layers hidden state with some weights. Same thing, right? I mean, it's exactly the same thing. The only difference is that you are computing attention on yourself. So then the real difference here is that how are we gonna compute SI, right? How do we compute SI? As, what, is this, what, what are we computing simil similarity between if you wanna compute SI? And 
in this case, it's not cross attention. So we're not computing attention between context and question, context to question or question to context. It's from itself to itself, right? So then the only difference is that now SI is proportional to exponentiation of similarity between basically the current time step that we're looking at here and the target h of i1. Do you get the point here, the, the, what, what the difference is? Basically, if this was a attention from context to question, then this would have been instead u of j of u of j, right? But then we replaced that with h of i. But other things are exactly the same. And how you compute the similarity is also the same. So it makes sense because why don't we, it's basically just the same way of using attention, but now we're just applying the attention itself. The only bad, the, the only, the really the trouble here is that now the architecture is becoming like crazily really long and very complex and a lot of layers with attention like going back and forth, right? But hopefully you get the point that um, once we have applied that, we can actually be aware of not only the question, but context will be also aware of itself that's very far away. And this was uh, 2017, I would say late 2017 um, around. And then about that time, actually, concurrent work was exactly also self-attention in the MT domain, coming back to machine translation. And the really the idea was that if you look at how it was getting complicated, more complicated in the machine reading comprehension, um, the really the idea was that if we uh, try to apply that, although that was for machine translation, but if we try to apply that for MRC or anything else, really the idea is that, okay, I mean, if you're using self-attention, why don't we just use self-attention? That like we just get rid of the cross-attention. And at first, this sounds not workable because if you use, use your self-attention, then how can the question and context be aware of each other? But there is a very easy solution, right? Um, that is that if we can just concatenate the question and context, so instead of considering these two as a separate inputs, let's say that we just concatenate the question side. Actually, this, this is typo, by the way. This is a question. If we just concatenate here, and then just get rid of this, like, um, and then just have one LSTM and get rid of this by, by attention and just, just apply self-attention. If you do a self-attention on the concatenated input, isn't it clear that it will be also involving some cross attention between text and qu question because if you're basically attending on yourself where yourself is both text, context and question, right? So if you actually concatenate and then self-attention, basically what we, people realize is that, okay, this is equivalent to actually doing cross attention, right? In other words, we don't have to worry about cross attention at all if we just use self attention. And another thing was then, um, this was, I think, relatively, I think, um, I would say, yeah, this was uh, something that was very concurrently explored, I think, that people have thought of oh, self attention is basically a superset of cross attention. But other, another, really, the, I would say, the, relatively, I'll say at this point, it's not crazy, but back then it was quite crazy that would it be also possible to get rid of RNNs, which is LSTM, GRU, etc., and just use self-attention. So why would one do that? So there is a really big advantage if this was possible which is that LSTM GRUs are sequentially dependent, which means they are not parallelizable
which is very inefficient if you want to do some training. Also, of course, inference, right? Self-attention, on the other hand, is uh, fully parallelizable per layer. So it's very good for um, good with using GPUs. But apparently, we thought the community thought that the RN was like very important because if you want to have some sequential dependency, then how can you get rid of that attention? If you just do attention, then if let's say that we just compute the attention, so I will show you that why this would not work if you just get rid of RNNs, because that means then you're basically having word embeddings, right? This goes to hidden states, but this was basically the, the point of RNNs. But if we just skip that, and then we just apply some self-attention on top of this, then the problem is that, of course, it doesn't matter where what I is, right? I mean, you can just shuffle the words and just still have the same self-attention values and results. So it would not work if you just get rid of RNNs. So in order to get rid of um, in order to get rid of RNNs, you had to have some sequential dependency. But I mean, that was the whole point of getting rid of RNNs, right? So that was a very dilemma, and that that's I think um, something that at least like back then people thought RNNs were like very um, a must in NLP. It, you cannot get rid of that at all. Although it's very very bad for the um, very inefficient during training. But um, but then the I think um, there was a really big need for getting rid of RNNs back then, and that was exactly the what inspired the uh, the creation of Transformer in 2017. This was actually a present in NeurIPS 2017. Back then it was NeurIPS actually, and that was basically really the um, I think uh, the one of the the transforming moments in NLP is because getting rid of RNNs not only enabled us to more make the training more efficient, but another thing that was byproduct, I, which I think is a really more, perhaps more impactful than getting rid of RNN due to the efficiency issue, is that basically transformer or uh, the architecture that the uh, in this paper proposed was very close to universal approximator which means that before the introduction of transformer or until like 2017, people were concerned a lot about how to create good, good, good neural architecture. And that's basically giving an inductive bias to the model, right? That you're basically giving some design choices to the model so that the model can work or it can get better results. And the point here was that of course, uh, if you want to, actually, the theoretically, you know that neural net is a universal approximator. So if you have a really super dense neural net, it is guaranteed that you can approximate any function. But the problem is that if you just build like a naive uh, dense neural net, then your model will most, most surely overfit and very hard to train. So that's why you had to give some inductive bias or some architectural assumption about how the, the input to output should work inside the uh, neural network. One of the really most famous example is actually CNN, right? Convolution neural net is inspired by how really the human eyes work and still is dominant, although there are other works such as visual transformer that are trying to replace it. And I think um, what uh, the transformer really has introduced us is that it's maybe that we don't really have to worry much about how the architecture looks like inside in many cases, not all cases, of course, but inductive bias is certainly overcomable when we have enough size of data. And also the model is big enough. So I'll just give you a really brief concept of what Transformer does. So in fact, actually just looking at the, its core concept is very, uh, very relevant to what we have covered today and last lecture is just that Basically, you, you get rid of all the RNNs, but you try to give the sense of uh, where each token belongs to, like its position by using some sinusoidal position embedding. 
so that you can get rid of RNNs safely. In fact, now people have uh, found that this is actually, it works usually better when you replace this with um, more of a, uh, I would say, um, learnable position embedding that depends directly on the position instead of uh, some cyclic sinusoidal graphs. And this, on, this uses self-attention only on the encoder side, but also actually decoder side. Transform was originally pr uh, proposed for the um, machine translation. And another important concept is actually multi-head attention. So this is actually a bit different from what we have uh, discussed up to now. Up to now, the attention that we were talking about can be considered as single head. And this has uh, limitations. And one of uh, the what the transformer proposed to overcome that limitation is making that into multi-head. So we'll be getting into that in the next lecture too. And again, all these three characteristics actually enable the model to be easily scaled up. And I'm not just talking about the efficiency which is paralyzable, uh, paralyzable characteristic, but also the fact that we don't have to worry about the model's detailed architecture too much and we can simplify it, but just scale up. Simple, but large architecture. So, that was uh, the really the, I think, really brief introduction to transformer. We'll, we're gonna spend probably two lectures on transformer because this is really the, um, I, I, I personally think is like the building block of the modern NLP. So we're gonna spend next Monday and uh, Wednesday uh, on the transformer. So uh, if you have time, you, you might want to also read the paper and also um, the annotated transformer I just talked about. It's very uh, well annotated well-explained, detailed, detailed, detailed explanation of transformer with, with real code on Jupyter Notebook. I'm gonna share that on the GitHub, uh, on the website, class website. So, yep, so uh, the class will end here. And basically up to now, we have covered all these. Now we're moving into transformer. And after transformer, we'll talk about language model briefly And once we have completed that, basically we are, we have covered, I would say, not everything of course in NLP, but major things in NLP up to um, 2017. That's corresponding to vanilla learning, I would say paradigm. And it's in 2018, which is like three years ago, we will see that it moves from vanilla training to pre-trained model fine tuning, but um, we'll get, get to that, I think in like probably mid April, we still have a few weeks to explore, I think other things in between, but that will be basically concluding the first phase of uh, our class. Okay, thanks a lot. See you on next Monday.